Hello and welcome to my review of the Star Wars novel Aftermath Empire's End. Now this is going to be probably a longer video for my channel because books obviously have a lot more in them than movies do and so this will be a spoiler review also. I don't like have a hard copy because I read it on my phone so I can just take the book anywhere I go and so I can be like, look, this is the book I read, you know. Anyway, like I said, spoiler review. So if you have not read it, then, you know, click away if you care about spoilers. But if you don't care about spoilers, there's not too much in here that really has to do or that could really spoil something from, say, the movies, any of them really. So it's not that big of a deal. Um, so here we go. Uh, Aftermath. I read the book previous to this book, uh, Life Debt, because there's three in the trilogy. The first one is called Aftermath, the second one is called Life Debt, and the third one is this one, The Empire's End. And I read Life Debt like last week, pretty much. And the reason I read it is because I read the first Aftermath book, and I wasn't blown away by it, so I was like, whatever. If this next one is good, I'll read it. But I never really got around to Life Debt until like two weeks ago. So I read it then because I heard that Empire's End was really good. And so I blew through that one. And then I blew through Empire's End. And I really enjoyed this trilogy as a whole. Yeah, the first one I didn't really... I wasn't blown away by it, like I said, but... It was probably because I was expecting from from what I had been hearing about the book. It was that it was the first book that takes place after Return of the Jedi, and I was like, "Yes, I want that." I, you know, that's what that's the most intriguing part because in between episodes six and seven are like there's so much room and there's so much things there's so much possibility for stuff through there, and I was expecting stuff with Luke and Han and Leia. We got a little bit of Leia in that one, but in this one, man, in Empire's End, we get a lot of Leia. We get a lot of Han, thankfully. In Life Dead, we got some Han. Um, we did we did get a, a quite a bit of Han, but in this one, in Empire's End, um, it's really it's really different, you know. We get Han, but he's like in this one. He's got a beard. They describe him as like he. If you thought he was scruffy looking back in Empire Strikes Back, like now he's really scruffy looking because he's got a beard. He's got you know he's Ben is born in this movie, and so like our main cast: uh, Grand Admiral Ray Sloan, Nora Wexley, Sinjir Rath Velas, John Burrell. Um, Leia, Han, and Chewie. We find out that Chewie has a Wookiee family, which is weird because he's been with Han for a long time. And how does... Maybe... I, I have no idea how he have, has a family. He just left him for Han? But whatever. And then Temin, um, Nora Wexley's son, is in this movie. He's really cool. I really enjoyed him. They have an amazing uh, battle... The Battle of Jakku is like what this book was marketed as, and it totally delivers. In that battle, Temin is in an X-wing, and like he just he jumps, he comes out of hyperspace, and then he's just like overwhelmed. And it's a beautifully done um, battle, space battle, and on the ground battle. Mister Bones in this one just I think he gets funnier in this one. He's the B1 robot, the uh, yeah the Clone Wars robot from the separatist side and he's cool i mean he gets funnier he does he does have his roger roger but it's it's totally works with three movies that actually help his development and why he's like that and temin is temin and him have a temin and wick and mr bones have a really cool relationship and jazz Amari, the bounty hunter that's with him sorry sorry i hit the thing the bounty hunter that's with them is really cool. I enjoyed her. I enjoyed how she used her Zabrak horns to get out of a tough situation there. Uh, Mon Mothma is very much in this. And at the end of the book, like, they have they have a part where somebody tries to blow her up. And Sinjir Rathvelis is like, he's, he's her advisor at the end. 
and he's like he gets almost shell shocked because he thinks that she got blown up, but she didn't. Fortunately for us, because I was like, no way. I was like totally not blown away, but I was very sad for a while there when I was reading it. I was like, they just killed Mon Mothma. Lando's in this one. He's in one of the interludes. Uh, I'll get to that in a bit, but he's really cool. Brenton Wexley. Yes, Nora's husband and Temin's dad. They find him in this book, and it's really, it's really cool. What ha- I mean, it's kind of cool what happens, but I really enjoyed that in this book, they didn't waste time. Like, really, it picks up kind of immediately because our rebel band consisting of Nora, Sinjir, John Burrell, uh, Tamin, Mr. Bones, ja- and Jazz, they're like, they're on the hunt for Imperials, and they're, they're kind of like bounty hunters, but bounty hunters that work, that are, you know, rebels from, not rebels anymore, but they're from the New Republic, and they're like rounding up, they're going after high-ranking Imperials, and it's really cool how it opens up, and the character, like, it it just it goes off with a bang this this book does it we hit the ground running because we had two books to set up why these character like who these characters are and what's going on with them and then this book is just like you know what forget all that backstory if you want a backstory you would have read those other two books because the the title clearly says aftermath and then it says the third book so if you want a backstory read those two this one is all about getting to Jakku and Jakku is like really important and this book is all about let's go like we got all of our exposition out of the way this one we're doing it I very much like that we picked up immediately I like that the characters are well developed like I said that first aftermath book I did not greatly enjoy it but it did set up it it did set up very much a lot of these characters that we have now um it was kind of different because it was like, wait, who who are these people? I wanted Han, Luke, and Leia, but these people, you know, they're not who I was expecting. In the second book, Life Debt, we got, I, st- I very much liked them. I got why, I just started to like them in that book because I had been with them through the first book and in that book. And in that book, they really, they, you know, they captured me. And in this book, they really make it seem like this team is a family. And I really... I enjoyed that, man. I got I got a kick out of it. I I very much liked that they gave very real family esque to our band of rebel bounty hunters or rebel imperial hunters. It was very very well developed. I very much enjoyed it, and I want more from these characters. Like that's the thing with pretty much every single Star Wars book I have ever read. I want more with the characters. When I'm done with, when I was done with the Darth Bane trilogy, I wanted more with Darth Bane and and Zana. I wanted, you know, when I was done with, um, with the Thrawn, with the Thrawn Empire's uh, heir to the Empire, the the uh, the EU book. I wanted more from those characters. When I read like A New Dawn with Kanan and, uh. Hera, I wanted more from those characters, and that's something that this mo- this book does very well. I know I'm probably not going to get more, but I want more with these characters, and they very much they very much end it in a beautiful way that gives us a nice come up and not a comeuppance, but a nice uh, tying of the bow on all of our characters, except for John Burrell. They did they did give him an a genuine ending where him and Jazz and Mari are they're they're in love and Jazz is on Jakku but John and John Burrell goes to Jakku with the rest of the New Republic forces to fight the Empire and hopefully defeat them for the last time to completely do with the way with the Empire and he dies there and we get this thing that Jazz, Jazz sees like this video or this hollow from the ship he was on, and he apparently sees a a missile coming straight after the ship, 
and instead of just allowing the missile to hit the ship and having all of his his uh, fellow commandos die, he literally jumps out of the ship and and goes head first and just direct impacts with the missile. It to me, I would have been like, wow. I was I was like, wow. That's that's pretty cheesy. The fact that he could get in the direct path of the missile is just it. It wasn't great. That was the only. Th that was he was the only character. John Burrell is that they didn't really wrap up his story in a way that was on par with the rest of the stories. Everybody else they wrapped him up very beautifully, and I wanted more. Uh, the book opens up, like I said, with the rebels hunting down the Imperials, and what I really think that they did very well in this movie that they haven't done in the past very well. <clears throat> is politics in this movie and in I mean in this book and in this book we get that it's not only politicians that are messing things up in the galaxy it is also the crime syndicates and there's one thing that Ray Sloan thinks about and she thinks with the Empire you know being crushed with it being splintered up with it not having unity and having control over the galaxy that opens up for crime syndicates like the Black Sun and the Red Key to take over worlds and pretty much enslave worlds and Ray Sloan to me put it in a very logical way where the Empire's gone, so crime just goes up. It goes through the roof. And she's like, no, when the Empire was around, the crime syndicates were not ruling whole planets, you know? And that's something that I could totally get behind. Like, crime is not good. And the fact that, yes, when the Empire was at its peak, crime wasn't as big as it is now. But since there is that void of power and that void of a you know a protection from the empire so to speak as far as ray sloan thinks because there's that void of the empire's uh iron hand if you will on the galaxy crime is like back to it's very relevant again and she has a very good admiral ray sloan Grand Admiral Ray Sloan has a very awesome arc in this book, and I very much enjoyed her probably more than anybody else in the book to me. And what I really enjoyed is that Gallius Rax, at the end of Life Debt, he's he's not in that book a lot. In this book, he is in it very much, and he's kind of playing, he's kind of playing the Palpatine, but not quite Palpatine. See, Palpatine in the prequels, he was controlling things, yes, from behind the scenes, but he was also, you know, in front. He was the Chancellor. He was that, he was pretty much the face of the Republic, but in this one, Gallius Rax is playing Ray Sloan, and it's because she is f entitled pretty much the leader of the biggest and most important uh, remnant of the Empire. She is Grand Admiral and she controls the Imperial Navy. Pretty much she controls all of the ships and all of the Star Destroyers. And Gallius Rax is playing her because he's kind of her advisor, but yet she knows and the other people that are high up enough know that she's not really the per she's not really the one controlling things Gallius Rax is and Gallius Rax has this thing well it's called a contingency and this is where the interludes come in and in life did I really I didn't all that enjoy the interludes until the very last one like the very end of life debt was an interlude with Palpatine and young Gallius Rax and I was I dug it with the biggest shovel ever I loved it and in this one the interludes are really really good I enjoyed every single one of them they have an interlude where we're on Tatooine and we find out a dude 
took Boba Fett's armor. Yeah, and it's not Boba Fett because this guy's like, he's kind of a sheriff of a nearby town. And he's, he's like, kind of, he's messing around with uh, taking out pirates that are on Tatooine. You know, people from uh, Jabba the Hutt's place. And he's wearing Boba Fett's armor. And I was like, well, because, yeah. And I was very intrigued because when uh, Jabba the Hutt's, his, uh, his yacht thing, when that thing gets blown up in Return of the Jedi, in this book it explains in in that interlude that it fell into the Sarlacc pit and it kind of hurt the Sarlacc a lot and it opened up the Sarlacc to where now Jawas are like they're scavenging for things from inside of the Sarlacc and apparently this guy got Boba Fett's armor from in there so I'm wondering if Boba Fett lived, it's not, it's not implied that he's dead, but it's not implied that he's alive either. And so I found that really interesting. There were three interludes, I believe, with the Emperor in this in this book, and they're really awesome. I enjoy everything. Like, it's cool to see things like people using the Force in a TV show like Rebels or a movie like Episode Seven. But in this book, they make literally the most mediocre thing that you could do with the Force. Like Palpatine comes in, he, you know, and Gallius Rax is in a seat in his, um, in a little meeting room. And Palpatine literally just put, picks up a chair with the Force and puts it to where he wants to sit down. And I was like, dude. Like, wh and then he picks up a table and puts it in between them. And then he puts, like, one of those chess boards, like the one in the Millennium Falcon, um, on the table. And I was literally, it's so amazing the way they describe him using the Force and how Gallius Rax reacts to him using the Force. It was like, this dude, Gallius Rax called him, like, a wizard, called him nutty. And he was, Gallius Rax was even afraid that the emperor might read his mind and it was so awesome just to it's so awesome to have a description of somebody using the force especially somebody like palpatine but palpatine had a contingency he had a plan for if he did die and gallius rax was the contingency where if the Empire did start to crumble, if it was defeated and the Emperor killed, Gallius Rax was the contingency in that. The Emperor told him that Jakku was very important a thousand years ago, before the events of, of Endor. And he said that Jakku was important a long time ago, and it will be important again soon. And what he did, which something that kind of bothers me about the book, is that the Emperor had machinery just dig a shaft straight into the planet core of Jakku. And his plan for a contingency on... And his contingency was just that Gallius Rax... In the event that the Emperor died, Gallius Rax would get all of the the Empire together on Jakku, and then he would blow up Jakku, which is something that I, I still don't understand to this day, is that you drill a hole to the core, and literally the only thing that he does to start the, re the chain reaction, I guess, of blowing up Jakku is he throws one of the acolytes of Palpatine into the core with like a Sith mask and a Sith holocron and I I don't I never understood that I still it's one of the things that kind of bothers me about the book is that his plan hinges on him just throwing a dude into the core, just one dude into the core of Jakku, and that will blow, that will cause the planet to blow up? Like, okay. You know, 
whatever, but that's that's one of the few things or one of the only things really that doesn't agree with me uh with this book, but everything else I really I really enjoyed that and like the John Burrell not really wrapping up his story very well. It was beautiful and I very much like that at the end Ray Sloan ends up killing Gallius Rax because you know, she just doesn't like she doesn't like him being the puppet master of the empire. She and so she kills him and she takes the itty bitty part of the empire that is still remaining and she goes into wild space. And now this is where a lot of people now are speculating on where Snoke could be from or who he is because in life debt there is a mention of an ancient being that will come back and in the end of this we have Ray Sloan going into wild space and what I'm hearing what the theories that I'm hearing are that Snoke is someone who is an ancient being who is in wild space now to me, I wouldn't really enjoy it. like it wouldn't I wouldn't want that to be honest because I don't really like the whole oh an ancient evil awakens like it didn't work out for X-Men Apocalypse that movie and so if it does turn out that Snoke is an ancient being who has been living in wild space for hundreds of years then oh I I really wouldn't enjoy it I personally wouldn't enjoy it now they can if they wanted to do something like Snoke is just another Sith but who was you know who is in uh, who was in wild space because in the old Republic there was a time, there was another time where there was a long period where the emp the Sith Empire was believed to be dead to the galaxy. And it came back because the reason they thought it was dead was because it just went into the far reaches of the galaxy. And so if they explain it away to where Snoke is part of something that just like the Sith were almost destroyed and only a few of them got away and Snoke is one of those few and he just like went to the edges of you know he went to beyond wild space that would kind of make sense to me but I still I don't like the idea of awakening an ancient evil or an ancient evil returning it never it doesn't agree with me with X-Men Apocalypse or anything else like that. I don't really enjoy things where it's like, you know, the devil has come back. He hasn't been around for a thousand years, but he's back now. Like, that never really, that never intrigues me. I would rather, Star Wars has always had things that have been su super grounded in reality, whereas I be if you had a Yoda ripoff who's been in hiding for years th a thousand years then like dude Snoke should be on his deathbed by now I don't care if he uses the force to keep himself alive I never I never really enjoyed something like that with the EU I've read the old Republic books where you had Emperor Vitiate who lived for hundreds and hundreds and yeah, over a thousand years I believe just because he figured out how to steal people's life energy using the dark side of the force and use it for himself. I never I never really dug that. So it would kind of disappoint me if Snoke is this thousand year old, you know, dude who's in wild space because what he says in the novelization of Star Wars uh, episode 7 is that he saw the rise and fall of the Empire and if you're in wild space I don't care what kind of connection you got you're not getting like hollow vids from 
from the Empire. And plus, he in that book, he also said that he knew that Anakin was Darth Vader and not just because, you know, Luke said it or not just because uh, Leia said it. He knew that because he must have been around. And so if he's in the if he's in wild space, then there's no way he knows that thing. So I personally don't subscribe to the theory that he's an ancient being from wild space. If he does, I'll kind of be disappointed, to be honest. But Empire's End does open up a lot of possibilities as far as what what could happen <clears throat> and it does it does give us a one of the best painting painting of the the galaxy as it is right now in episode 7 and in episode 8 it it does really give us quite a bit as to what happened with the empire you know the empire just didn't disappear with endor and this is a very good book on what it takes to really win a war you it's not just one battle it's a lot of battles and in this one even even though you win even though the new republic won all the battles they still didn't destroy the empire so but it did not it does have the very beginnings of the the first order it there is a mention i believe of a phasma like character we get a young hux in this book and he's like a lunatic i mean he's nuts man i don't know i don't know why ray sloan kept that dude around but the kid is a nut like he's a psychopath and it's very cool i very much enjoyed like i said all the characters in this no matter how much if they have a lot of uh dialogue and a lot of development but and if they have a little like like young Hux, like he's literally like 13 years old and he's he's commanding people to kill he's commanding his own you know, friend, friends, they're like kids, and he's telling them, go kill this Imperial dude because Gallius Rax told me to. Like, it's it's nuts, and it's, it's amazing. Like, Gallius Rax in this book, he does go out ki like kind of a chump. I mean, he just, Ray Sloan just kind of shoots him, and they built it up to where I thought he was going to, he was going, I personally, when I started the book, I was like, Maybe Gallius Rax is Snoke. Definitely not. He gets shot up and he's dead. <laughs> he is dead. There's no way that dude's coming back. He is buried in some Imperial uh, compound, underground, on Jakku. Nobody's going to find him, not even Ray. Like, he's not Snoke. So, there you go. That's my recap interview. I'm sorry if I ranted a lot or talked a lot and didn't sound like I was here it's kind of late and i didn't want to i didn't want to have to edit a video that would be this long and you know do the cuts and the transitions and what uh, what not so yeah that's why i just did it all try to do it all in one take but if you watch this thank you don't know why but thank you it's really appreciated if you watched it all the way through dude good on you man because i know my my analytics on youtube says that nobody watches over like two minutes of like nobody watches past like two minutes in my video and i'm just like fine whatever but if you watch like t almost 30 minutes of this uh of this recap of this book like standing 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 ovation you know but anyway, that's that's my recap and review of Aftermath's Empires. And if I didn't sound comprehensive, don't don't hold it against me. Don't give me that dislike. Cause come on, if you dislike a if you dislike a video on YouTube, just click away. You don't you don't have to give me the dislike too. Anyway, thank you for watching. And if you're this far, dude. Dude, thank you. Like, genuinely, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Click subscribe there if you enjoyed this and want to see more things like this. And comment down below. Like, just comment down below. I Just comment down below if you want more book reviews of Star Wars books. Because, like, now I'm reading Catalyst, the Rogue One novel, because I, I didn't want to read it. But now, like... It, it, I got a discount 
on Audible, and I was like, yeah, let's let's do it. And so I'll probably put up a review of that, try to get it, you know, under 30 minutes. Anyway, but comment down below if you enjoyed this. Subscribe if you want to see more. And let's talk Star Wars. I mean, you know, let's just do it.